um, do you love your wife? Yes. Right? Prove it. Like, what's the metric? Give me the number that helps me know, right? Because when you met her, you didn't love her, right? Sure. Now you love her, right? Tell me the day the love happened. It's an impossible question, right? But it's not that it doesn't exist. It's that it's much easier to prove over time, right? So all leadership is the same thing. It's about transitions. So if you were to go to the gym, right? It's like exercise, right? If you go to the gym and you work out and you come back and you look in the mirror, you will see nothing. And if you go to the gym the next day and you come back and you look in the mirror, you will see nothing, right? <laughs> so clearly there's no results, can't be measured. It must not be effective. So we quit, right? Or if you fundamentally believe that this is the right course of action and you stick with it, like in a relationship, I bought her flowers and I wished her a happy birthday and she doesn't love me. Clearly I'll give up, you know? That's not what happens. If you believe there's something there, you commit yourself to act, an act of service. You commit yourself to the regime, the exercise. You can screw it up. You can eat chocolate cake one day. You can skip a day or two. It, it allows for that. But if you stick with it consistently, I'm not exactly sure what day, but I know you'll start getting into shape. I know it. And the same with the relationship. It's not about the events. It's not about intensity. It's about consistency. You go to the dentist twice a year, your teeth will fall out. You have to brush your teeth every day for two minutes. What does brushing your teeth twice a day for two minutes do? Nothing. Unless you do it every day, twice a day, for two minutes. It's the consistency. Going to the gym for nine hours does not get you into shape. Working out every day for 20 minutes gets you into shape. You see, what stands between us and achieving even our most ambitious dreams has far less to do with possessing some magical skill or talent and far more to do with how we approach problems and make decisions to solve them. And because of the continuous and compounding nature of all those millions of decisions that we face on a regular basis, even a marginal improvement in our process can have a huge impact on our end results. And I'll prove this to you by taking a look at the career of Novak Djokovic. Back in 2004, when he first became a professional tennis player, he was ranked 680th in the world. It wasn't until the end of his third year that he jumped up to be ranked third, uh, third in the world. He went from making 250,000 a year to five million a year in prize money alone. And of course he did this by winning more matches. In 2011, he became the number one ranked men's tennis player in the world, started earning an average of 14 million a year in prize money alone and winning a dominating 90% of his matches. Now here's what's really interesting about all of these very impressive statistics. Novak doesn't control any of them. What he does control are all the tiny little decisions that he needs to make correctly along the way in order to move the, the probability in favor of him achieving these types of results. And we can quantify and track his progress in this area by taking a look at the percentage of points that he wins. Because in tennis, the typical point involves one to maybe three decisions, I like to refer to this as his decision success rate. So back when he was winning about 49% of the, point, the uh, matches he was playing, he was winning about 49% of the points he played. Then to jump up, become number three in the world, and actually earn $5 million a year for swinging a racket, he had to improve his decision success rate to just 52%. Then to become not just number one, but maybe one of the greatest players to ever play the game, he had to improve his decision success rate to just 55%. Now I keep using this word just. I don't want to imply this is easy to do. Clearly it's not. But the type of marginal improvements that I'm talking about are easily achievable by every single one of us in this room. And I'll show you what I mean. From kindergarten all the way through to my high school graduation, yes, that's high school graduation for me. <laughs> every one of my report cards basically said the same thing. Stephen's a very bright young boy. If only he would just settle down and focus. What they didn't realize was I wanted that even more than they wanted it for me. I just couldn't. And so from kindergarten straight through the second year of college, I was a really consistent C, C minus student. But then going into my junior year, I'd had enough. I thought I want to make a change. I'm going to make a marginal adjustment and I'm going to stop being a spectator in my decision-making and start becoming an active participant. And so 
That year, instead of pretending again that I would suddenly be able to settle down and focus on things for more than five or 10 minutes at a time, I decided to assume I wouldn't. And so if I wanted to achieve the type of outcome that I desired, doing well in school, I was going to actually have to change my approach. And so I made a marginal adjustment. If I would get an assignment, let's say read five chapters in a book, I wouldn't think of it as five chapters. I wouldn't even think of it as one chapter. I would break it down into these tasks that I could achieve that would require me to focus for just five or 10 minutes at a time. So maybe three or four paragraphs, that's it. I would do that. When I was done with those five or 10 minutes, I would get up, I'd go shoot some hoops, do a little drawing, maybe play video games for a few minutes, and then I'd come back. Not necessarily to the same assignment, not even necessarily to the same subject, but just to another task that required just five to 10 minutes of my attention. From that point forward, all the way through to graduation, I was a straight A student. Dean's list, president's honor roll, every semester. I then went on to one of the top graduate programs in the world for finance and economics. Same approach, same results. So then I graduate, I start my career and I'm thinking, this worked really well for me. You know, you take these big concepts, these complex ideas, these big assignments, you break them down to much more manageable tasks. And then along the way, you make a marginal improvement to the process, you know, the odds of success in your favor, I'm gonna try and do this in my career. So I did. I started out as an exotic derivatives trader at Credit Suisse. It then led me to be global head of currency option trading for Bank of America, global head of emerging markets for AIG International. It helped me deliver top tier returns as a global macro hedge fund manager for 12 years and to become founder and CIO of two award winning hedge funds. So it gets to 2001 and I'm thinking, this whole idea, it worked really well in school. It's been serving me well as a professional. Why aren't I applying this in my personal life? Like to all those big ambitious goals I have for myself. So one day I'm walking to work and at the time my, my commute was a walk from one end of Hyde Park to the other in London. It took me about 45 minutes each way. Hour and a half a day, seven and a half hours a week, 30 hours a month. 360 hours a year when I was awake, aware, basically wasting time listening to music on my iPod. So on my way home from work that day, I stopped at the store. I picked up the first 33 CDs in the Pimsleur German language program, ripped them and put them onto my iPod. But I didn't stop there. Because the truth of the matter is, I'm an undisciplined person. And I knew that at some point, I'd switch away from the language and go back to the music. So I removed that temptation by removing all of the music. It left me with just one option, listen to the language tapes. So 10 months later, I'd listen to all 99 CDs in the German language program. Listen to each one three times each. I then went to Berlin for a 16 day intensive German course. When I was done, I invited my wife and kids to meet me. We walked around the city, I spoke German to the Germans, they spoke German back to me. My kids were amazed. I mean, that couldn't close their jaws. But you and I, we know, there's actually nothing amazing about what I'd just done. I made this marginal adjustment to my daily routine. 